Coming up next on Passion Struck. There's a chapter in the book that talks about, it's called Be Amazed. Looking at our planet from space, I thought I was looking into absolute paradise and can't imagine any place being more beautiful than our planet, our home. As far as us mattering, I think we matter a lot because we got a really cool place to live. I believe that there is life other places. I don't think we've encountered it yet, but I think we're going to find each other at some point. But I would be shocked if wherever they are, they have a place as beautiful as our planet. And I think we are in a very unique spot. It's a complete and utter paradise that we're living in. I think you see its true beauty from space. And maybe that's what people define as the overview effect. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion struck. I am so excited today to welcome astronaut Dr. Mike Massimino to Passion Struck. Welcome, Mike. John, thanks for having me. I'm going to start out today's interview by asking a question I love to ask, which is we all have moments that define who we are or who we want to become. Can you take us back? To that moment as a six-year-old when thoughts of you going into space started coming into your head the day after seeing Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon? Certainly, John. Thanks for having me. And whoever's listening, thank you for listening. I, yeah, I can very clearly remember that event. I was six years old. And the whole moon program and the Apollo missions that came before, like Apollo 8 and Apollo 9 and 10 that led up to Apollo 11. I remember them. I remember those things happening as well. And to me, it, it I just got the sense that this was the most important thing going on in the world at the time. And it was. It had. It was a lot going on at that time in the late 60s, as there's always a lot going on in the world. But this seemed to really be a good thing that had captured everyone's imagination and interest around the world, not just in the United States, but everyone was paying attention to what was going on with the moon landing. And I felt like this was the most significant thing that had happened in my, in my short lifetime at the time at six years old. But I also had the sense that this is the most important thing that's going to happen for hundreds of years. I had that sense that this is really significant. And as a little kid, I remember thinking that clearly. We had learned about things that had happened hundreds of years before with the explorers coming to the new world and uh, how that was a significant thing back then. But I felt like you know, that's what I was learning about as a little kid. But I felt like this was going to be on that level as far as exploration goes and expanding our horizons. This was the next level. And uh, I still feel that way about it. I don't see how we can ever top that. I don't think we ever will. And I think some people look at that as being disappointing. But I look at it as that's what it, such a great achievement it was. And for me, John, it wasn't just wanting to go to space. It was, I wanted to be like those astronauts. I wanted to be like Neil Armstrong, my hero. I wanted to be like, that's the way I wanted to grow up. I want to grow up to be that kind of person. And that's what got me interested as a six-year-old. And then of course, by the time I was eight years old, I was like, oh, this can never happen. But but at six years old, that's the way I felt about it. And that's the way I, I still feel about it. Well, referring to when you turned eight, that's when you experienced your fear of height, it made you start to rethink if this astronaut thing was really a possibility, but it wasn't until January 1986, and I remember it uh, quite clearly because I was a junior in high school watching it, like mm -hmm. many people were on TV, when the shuttle Challenger exploded. People don't think about it, but space travel is probably the most dangerous profession you could have. And I'm going to just use this example because before we got on, I told you I knew a number of astronauts. I met uh, your former classmate, Willie McCool, mm -hmm. uh, long before he became an astronaut. I ran cross country and track at the Naval Academy and he was quite a legend mm -hmm. and I met him and just was so inspired by him and had kept up with him during the time leading up to that launch. And the fact that I knew him 
made that Columbia disaster all the more real for me because sometimes we see these things and they don't really hit you as hard as when someone there. But I listened to another one of your episodes where you said that NASA found after they looked at the whole space shuttle program that about one in every 75 space shuttle flights, if I have it correctly, was going to end in disaster. And I wanted to ask you, figuring out that you still wanted to live your life even risk your life for something that you were willing to pursue your passion because you loved it. Why were you willing to take risks like those that are involved in the space program to go after it? I think what I felt at the time where I still feel about it is that I think you should be passionate about what you're doing to the point that you're willing to take a risk for it. That's the way I felt about the space program. I think some things are are worth a, a risk. I felt the space program was, and I think a dream is, if you're trying to accomplish something in life, something, whatever you're passionate about, there's always going to be uh, risks involved. Some of them are maybe financial or risk of your time. And maybe some of them even include a risk of your life from time to time. And you don't want to be foolhardy about that at any means, but I don't think we were in the space program. I think we were very careful and cautious as best we could be. But I felt like that the exploration of space and being an astronaut with NASA was worth the risk that we were going to be taking. And and I think that kind of shows you you're doing the right thing. Not that you want to do anything silly and hurt yourself or have anything bad happen, but what you want to be passionate enough about what you're doing that you're willing to take that risk. And when the Challenger accident happened, I was in between college and grad school working at IBM in New York City. And so I was getting ready to go to grad school to to try to pursue this dream a few months later. And, uh, but I was away from that. I wasn't really part of the program then, of course. I was working for IBM in, in New York. And when that happened, I felt isolated from being able to help. I was like, well, what, what can I do? This is a horrible thing. I, I wish I could be able to help in some way, be a part of it. Or, and it, in some ways, it made me realize how important it is to have something that you feel really strongly about. That uh, seeing that accident didn't scare me at all. It, it solidified what I was really interested in doing. That you should have a passion in your life that you're willing to risk your life for. And I wanted to be able to to do something. If, if an accident happened in the future, I wanted to be there to help. It solidified my interest and my passion for what I wanted to do. Well, I want to talk about your journey to becoming an astronaut. I was recently watching A Million Miles Away featuring mm-hmm. fellow astronaut Jose Hernandez. Yeah. And I remember interviewing Kayla Barron last year, who's a, a current astronaut. Mm-hmm or group 22. And I think what people don't understand is the selection process that goes into becoming an astronaut. Uh, She told me she was one of 12 out of 18,500 applicants. (laughs) And to put that in a different perspective, you have a better chance of becoming a four-star general in the Marine Corps than you do an astronaut, Mm -hmm. which is the hardest thing to attain in the military. Can you walk us through the emotional roller coaster of facing three rejections from NASA before you finally got the opportunity to pursue your dream? Sure. The hardest thing about becoming an astronaut and the hardest thing about a lot of things is just getting the opportunity to do it. As you said, the odds were against you. And there's a a chapter in my book, the first chapter is entitled One in a Million is Not Zero. I was coming up on my second rejection and I didn't know about it yet. (laughs) I have to know I was going to get rejected because by that point, people had been investigated their backgrounds and they weren't looking and no one was checking into me. So I hadn't been interviewed. This is my second application, the second time I was rejected. So I knew that their interviews were over and I wasn't part of that. So I was going to get rejected, although I hadn't gotten the official word for another week or so at this point. And I was watching the Academy Awards on TV. This is in 1992. And I was taking a break from the work I was doing to finish up my doctorate and went over to, to you know, they, they went live to the space shuttle on this one Academy Awards and the, the space shuttle crew was you know, floating around and playing around with this statuette that they had flown this Oscar that they had in space. And I knew with absolute clarity, John, that's what I wanted to do. The thought went to my mind. That's what I want to do. I want to be one of those people. And then it was a thought right after that that entered my mind, which was, but you'll never get a chance to do that. That's impossible. Who gets to do that? I wasn't even getting any close to it at all. I wasn't even a finalist. And I wasn't, wasn't getting an interview that time around, for example. And that's the way I felt a lot of times that it was just impossible. But then I put my fancy education at work at MIT and it was, well, one out of a million, which I thought my odds were, or maybe as 
Kayla said one out of 18,500 or whatever it was back then, those are pretty low odds. That's not much, but it's not zero. It's a very small number. And maybe if one out of a million is a bunch of zeros with a one at the end of it, but that's a non-zero outcome. And the only way that one disappears and it becomes a zero outcome, and you know what the result will be, is if you give up. Once you give up, Liz, with absolute certainty, you will not be successful. So I just tried to keep that in mind that this is unlikely, but it's not impossible. But the only way it becomes impossible is if I don't give it a try. And uh, my friend Joe Torrey, the baseball manager, said, I heard him say one time, you can control the effort, but not the outcome. And you can practice as hard and as long as you can, but you can't always control that outcome of whether or not you're going to win or lose. But you certainly can control your effort. And that's what I concentrated on, was trying to control my effort, not give up, and at least give my dream a chance. And so, yeah, I got dis- rejected outright twice. Third time I got an interview and was medically disqualified because of my eyesight. And when you get medically disqualified, what they told me was, is that they won't even read my application again. So I couldn't even try anymore, which was really disappointing. And they didn't accept LASIK or anything back then. Now it's all different. They've changed all the rules. So this is no longer, an, it wouldn't be an issue for me. But back then you had to see pretty well uncorrected vision and I couldn't do it. And I started talking to people to see what might be possible. And I learned about something called vision training, which is training your eyes and your brain to see better. It's like trying to focus at different at different distances so that you could see better than you're normally used to seeing. It didn't seem like it was going to much of it, it was definitely going to work, but I, I didn't have any other choice. So it's like, what else am I going to do here? So yeah, I gave it a try and I was able to pick up a couple lines on the eye chart to at least be able to apply again. I was able to re- send those results in and that allowed me to, to at least apply again. And I was able to get another interview. And then I got through the medical okay that next time. And on my fourth try, I was picked after a series of about trying for 10 years. I think when you're trying to pursue something that is unlikely, that uh, requires good fortune, I think involved with it too, but a lot of hard work and persistence, I think you have to be be willing to do that. And you owe it to yourself to give it a try. And the other thing is that if it never worked out, I wasn't doing things that I really were, were bad for me that I thought I, that weren't good for me. I was going to graduate school and getting good work experience and in working as a professor at the time at Georgia Tech when I was finally selected. So it wasn't like my efforts was leading me toward a toward, down a bad road, but it ultimately led me toward the toward success in trying to be an astronaut. But I think the main thing that I bring up in that first chapter is to remember that one in a million is not zero. And if there's even the slightest chance for success, and that's what your dream is, you owe it to yourself to give it a try. I can completely relate to you about this eye thing. Um, I wanted to be a pilot when I was at the Naval Academy. But Mm -hmm. when I was growing up as a kid, I had a condition called amblyopia, which means I had one eye much stronger than the other. So Mm -hmm. I tried and tried to pass the eye exam. And the closest Mm -hmm. I could get was 2025. And I remember they were trying to work with me. And I would spend hours trying to do this. And the closest I got I think was two out of five and I had to get three out of five to get qualified. Mm. I almost made it and it was so frustrating, but I wish I would have known more about your technique because similar to you, we LASIK wasn't an option and uh, the other things you could do were quite dangerous, especially if you were at altitude on how it could affect the eye. So I, I love that story. You never know. You got, and everyone, everyone faces obstacles. Some are, unexpected, but whatever that obstacle is, you got to try to figure a way to get around it. Well, I have a upcoming book myself, which comes out in uh, February. And one Mm -hmm. of the chapters I have on there is called, you need to be an action creator. And I based it on an interview I did with Wendy Lawrence, whom you know, and she has this saying that you have to give yourself permission to dream the dream. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure similar to you, you both have probably spoken to thousands of different audiences during your time as an astronaut now. But she tells me one of the things that really is alarming to her is how often she meets people who have these dreams and then they give up on them at the first setback that comes their way. What would be your advice for people, even if they have this one in a million shot of pursuing their dream, how to face setbacks that we all know are going to come our way. I think realize that everyone faces setbacks and all successful people have. 
but you just can't let it stop you no matter what it is, no matter where that challenge is. Remember that if you're going to into something difficult and you're going to get rejected here and there, it's very rare for anyone to go through life without having a setback. And I think that's where yeah. the the real test comes of, of who you are and, and how passionate you are about what you're doing. So just remember that you're not the first person to have failed at, at something. And you wouldn't be the first person to give up either because of those failures. But I think the category you want to be in is the person that doesn't let those setbacks stop them and that they just keep going, even when they, when it seems hopeless, just got to keep going. So then you uh, go into the astronaut program and I happen to be texting with another person, Sonny Williams last night, who told mm -hmm. me an interesting story about you. She said that after you got in the program, you have a big boss who you all work for, who mm -hmm. mis mistook you for another astronaut named Rick <laughs> Mastraccio. I, I hear it's a pretty funny story, and I was hoping you might be able to share it. Yeah, so my last name is Massimino, and Rick is, Mist is Mistracchio. Yeah, you know, it was a big, long Italian name with an M. It both started with the same three letters. So that was enough to confuse people. I think that's maybe how I got selected, is they thought I was him, or they weren't sure. So they said, ah, what the heck, take the both of them. But Rick and I are very good friends, and I uh, used to get mistaken all the time. In the clinic, they thought I was him half the time. They thought he was me. I went to vote one year, and he gave me his voting card. I'm like, this isn't me. And I got to hand the person my license, but I, they just, I, in Brooklyn, it wouldn't be a problem because there's a lot of different Italian names, but maybe down in Texas, there aren't as many or something, and they weren't used to it. So we would get mistaken all the time. When I first arrived at NASA, Rick had worked at the Johnson Space Center, as I had I, but I was working for a contract at McDonnell Douglas, and then it was off at Georgia Tech right before I got picked. But Rick had been at the Johnson Space Center working with the astronaut office pretty closely. And someone came up to me and said, oh, that was great work you did on the, the STA, the shuttle training aircraft and all that stuff. I didn't even know what the STA was. It was like my first week of work. I'm like, you got the wrong guy. He's no, you did a great job. And then after I was like, okay, fine, good. So I would always get compliments based on work that Rick did. Whereas I don't know what he, I don't think he got any compliments based on me, people thinking he was me. But so it might've worked in my favor. Anyway, the story that Sonny's probably referring to is that there was a flight that was about to be assigned, and I forget what it was, but it was like, but it was back in the flight. I ended up being their family escort, so I know that the flight w took place. I think it was like September, October of two thousand, of the year two thousand. So probably about a, a year before that or so, they were going to assign this crew, and so oh, I, the rumor was we thought it was going to be from our. They were going to put a couple of my classmates on it, and. We all thought the rumor was it was going to be Rick Mastracchio and another one of my classmates, Dan Burbank, who were going to be assigned to this flight. And uh, I get a call. On, uh, they, they were excited. What they were doing at the time is they would call you into the boss's office uh, over in Building One, the flight crew ops office, and then they would tell everybody, oh, you're going on the space flight. So that's a big day, right? So I get a call from the boss's uh, secretary. And I pick up the phone and she goes, hi, Mike, uh, how are you doing? I go, I'm doing fine. How are you? She goes, oh, I'm doing okay. But why aren't you over here? And this is, the, I know she's talking about the boss's office. And I'm like, am I in trouble? She goes, oh, no, not at all. And I go, then I don't think you want me over there. I think you're looking for someone else. And she goes, hang on. And she goes and checks, apparently. And she comes back. She goes, sorry, Mike, wrong guy. And she called the wrong guy. <laughs> so I almost got Rick's flight assignment. I probably should have played along. They might have, but they wouldn't have known maybe. And I, could have got to the point where it was too late for them to change their mind. But uh, yeah, I almost got assigned to, to Rick Mastracchio's first flight. So but it, it didn't, I, I couldn't let it go that far. I knew what was going on. They just got us mixed up because we got mixed up all the time. <laughs> I love that story. And yeah. I didn't realize how much thought went into getting selected for these flights. I was talking to Chris Cassidy about it and mm -hmm. the decisions he had to make when he was chief astronaut. Sometimes you've got a heavily Russian crew up there. And if a person's not good in R Russian, you can't send them up. Or maybe this is something that requires a specific type of ability to do a spacewalk. And if a person's mm -hmm. not good at it, then you've got to scrub them from that mission. Or there could be geopolitical things going on in the world that you need to take mm -hmm. into consideration or this or that. I, I never really understood how much thought went into who goes up and who doesn't. So interesting. Yeah, there's a lot. To, sometimes we wondered what they were coming up with because it's like <laughs> picking names out of a hat. I don't know if that's ever done. But uh, <laughs> but I think typically they want to look for a mixed skill set. You can't have all new guys or all experienced. You usually try to get a good mix. 
of veterans and new people and uh, try to give opportunities to the newer people when you can. I remember there was a French astronaut, Michel Tonini, when I was, he and I were working on a project together when I was new to the astronaut office. And he was telling me about constructing a crew. And he says, he goes, it's always good to have a funny guy on a crew. So you need one funny guy, right? And, and he goes, but not two. He goes, only one. If you have two, then it becomes too much. It becomes like a gang and nothing gets done. You need one funny guy. If you can't have a funny guy, that'd be great. But only one funny guy. No, not two. So I thought that was interesting. And that probably is part of it, too. You want to keep the crew personality mix if you can. But I think you know a lot of it is really what it comes down to is who could do the job and who's going to get the job done and what is best for the goals of the program and the office. And if they can, maybe they throw a funny guy in there as part of that. <laughs> When I was talking to Chris about you coming on the show, I happened to get to see him face to face a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. He said, I can't tell you much about Mass, except he is the funniest astronaut I've ever met in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I've like, got a, <laughs> a lot of good conversations with him. We, I remember doing, we both Capcommed a lot together. We would do these handovers and we would just tell each other what was going on in, the, in our lives. And it was some funny stories going back and forth. Yeah, I think he's a funny guy too, if you know what to ask him. Yeah. He does have that sense of humor. If you, yeah. Well, speaking of lightheartedness, I understand that every class is given a nickname. Kayla Barron, who I mentioned earlier, they were given the name the Turtles because a hurricane hit as they were going through training. Yeah. How did you become part of the Sardines? The, how did we get that name, you mean? Yes. So we were 35 Americans and nine international astronauts. So... The most they'd ever picked in any astronaut class was the original set of shuttle astronauts back in 1978. They picked 35 Americans. So now they match that number and then they picked, they had, they added nine international astronauts. So we had eight different countries represented. So we were the largest class ever. And they've never had a class as large as ours since. Already the office was, you need more people. And then when you get in the office, you don't want anybody else coming. <laughs> That's good. We've got enough now. We don't need anybody else. We'll take care of it from here. But no, you want to, you always want to have new, more people come in. But at that time, at the height of the shuttle program, we were flying uh, around five flights at a time and we were getting ready to build space station. We were still flying the shuttle. There was a lot of projects, a lot of work going on. So when we were flying the shuttle, you, you had typically seven crew members per flight. And so well, there was a lot of international astronauts, but you're flying a lot of Americans, maybe 25, 30 Americans a year were flying in space. And the office had become small, and we had a, a big growth in the number of astronauts. I connect that to George Abbey, who was the head of flight crew operations of the, at the beginning of the shuttle program, and then became the, at the time when I was selected, I think he was the head of the Johnson Space Center. And, and I think he saw the value of having a large astronaut corps, because you're not just flying in space, you're also doing jobs on the ground. Most of what you're doing is on the ground. Most of us, even those of us who spend lots of time in space, has spent the predominant amount of your career is on the ground. You have six years or so of training typically before you fly your first flight. You have a lot of work for people to do and get ready and plan and support. We were added to a growing astronaut office where they had just had a class in 1995. It was supposed to be the class in 94, but there were some budget issues or something. So that class, they were picking every two years back then. So they were having a class come in. So they had a class in 92, and then it was supposed to have a class in 94. And then they couldn't do that, so it ended up being a class of 95, but they wanted to stay back on the schedule, so then they had a class of 96. So they just had a group. I, that was a smaller group, maybe around 15 or so came in that, that time. But then we were coming in with 44 to what was perceived as a growing and already full office and where they were going to stick us. So it was like we were going to be jammed in like sardines. That's how we got the nickname, the sardines. Well, I'm going to jump back into the book. You write in your prologue, and I'm going to quote you, I had just enough smarts and talent and luck. But what I mostly had was determination, perseverance, and grit, combined with a passion that kept me going every time I got knocked down. And I got knocked down a lot. As I was telling you before we came on, I define passion struck as the combination of passion and perseverance, which is grit, mm -hmm. combined with intentionality. How do you think that your intentions have factored into how you have applied your grit? Your intentions being how you deliberately go after your goals. Oh, well, I think the grit comes in when things don't work out. When I decided that I wanted to somehow give it a try to become an astronaut, this was 
after I had graduated from college. So I had that little boy dream. And then I'm like, ah, no, this is impossible. And then after college, I got a job, as I said earlier, working at IBM, and uh, which was a great place to work. And I really enjoyed that time there. But it really, I didn't see it putting me on a path to get to space. And I could have I could still have applied, but I just, there's no, I, I think there's no way I'm, I would be accepted. And with that, I had to do something. And so there, I, I thought there were different options in front of me. One would be maybe to go the route that you had taken, although it was too late for me to go to an academy, but maybe to think of joining the military. But I think that you had to have reasons, I thought, that to do something that if it doesn't work out as an astronaut, that's the only reason why you shouldn't do that for the only reason that I'm going to go join the military to become an astronaut. And I, I have so much respect for you and Chris and all the other people you've mentioned that do that, and a deep amount of gratitude. And I wanted to serve my country, but I didn't think the military was the, the best way for me to do that. So I wasn't about to do that. So then I thought, okay, if I don't do that, what's my other option? And it was more the academic route. And I felt like I needed more education, which I was interested in getting anyway. And my intention at that point was to go to, to graduate school and get a degree, if it could lead me to the astronaut program, great. But if not, at least it could lead me to a career in the space program. And I, John, I thought that was a little more reasonable. I, at least maybe I could work and help other people go to space, even if I couldn't go myself. I could be part of the team that puts people in space and tries to solve some of the problems related to that. So that seemed to be so much of a, of a reasonable thing. And so I put my uh, intention in that area to go to grad school. And I was lucky enough to get into MIT and to study space-related research in areas that I was interested in, which was human machine systems and uh, people, robot versus machine or robots versus people. Was There's always this debate, technology and AI now and versus people. But even back then, back in you know, the 80s, that was a question of who's going to explore space, humans or machines. But I always felt it was a combination of humans with machines. And so human controlled robotics is what I got into for space exploration. And that was something I had some preparation for in college and an interest in. And so it's, my intention was to, number one, try to become an astronaut or at least get a competitive application together where I wasn't just trying to win the lottery, but I felt like I was giving myself a chance to be a, a good candidate. And then if that didn't work out, a way to contribute to the space program. I didn't know what that was going to mean. You know, it turned out that it could have been astronaut or could have been a professor, a faculty member, engineer, who knows what. But I knew that the graduate, or at least I felt in my case, the graduate degree was a really important thing to pursue with space-related research and try to b get relationships with NASA so I knew what was happening. So I worked for the summers with NASA. I ended up getting a NASA fellowship for grad school, got to know a lot of people at, at the space centers. And so that was, I guess that was one of my intentions. Now, when you decide you want to go to grad school, you're going to get hit with some obstacles like exams and tests. And, and one of my biggest obstacles trying to get my PhD was failing my qualifying exam. But at MIT, you have this, if you want to get a PhD, you have to pass this qualifying exam, which is both written and oral. So you have these written parts of the test in different subjects. And then you have an oral exam in front of the, of the faculty. And it can be brutal, not on purpose, but they're trying to test you, but also have you think and see how you're doing. And and so typically that you had, if you failed, and a lot of, not everyone passed on the first try, I think it was maybe 50-50 at that point. But most of the time, if you're willing to go through this torture a second time, you pass. Most people pass the second time. Occasionally that didn't work either. But, and then that was, you probably, you're out of options at that point. So I went in there and took this thing and got destroyed. And my, I failed it miserably. And I went in to see my advisor after to get the bad news. And he, he was like, oh, you didn't really do well. And you, know, you didn't pass. And we, it wasn't good. And then it was like so overwhelmingly bad. I don't think he really had any suggestions for me. It was just like, it was a disaster. I don't really, it was just terrible. And the, especially during the oral exam, I was just, I, I had vapor lock. I just got, they started asking me questions and I couldn't answer. And then they just, they were, they just came at me more or less, which is what their job was. And then, and I said, well, what's the story? Can I at least try again? And he goes, well, you could try again but you might want to think about it if it's worth your time. And he said, I remember him saying this to me, and he was a very kind man. He's still alive. He's still, I consider him a friend, but he was, he's a fatherly figure. He was m m older than I was, much older, and he could have, my father's age, he said, I might not be cut out for this, Mike, and you need to think hard whether or not you want to try again. Because based on the way I performed on the first exam, there was no way <laughs> that, was gonna, that they thought I could turn it around and, and pass a second time. And 
And that was pretty tough to hear. But I thought about it for a while. And I'm thinking, well, what do I really have to lose? Six months is going to go by anyway. And I was already at the school and I had a place to live. It just, I know it could take more time. I was, could still enroll. It was another six months of education. And I was funded too. I was getting, my funding wasn't going to stop because of this. So I could try again. So I was like, well, let me give it a try. So uh, I went back to him a couple of days later and told him that I wanted to try again. And he gave me this little smile and he said, Mike, if any speaking in generalities as an MIT professor might, he said, if one can learn to withstand indignities, one can go far in life, is what he told me. And I, it, he just kind of pulled that one out of his hat there. And I thought that was a pretty good way to, a fancy way to put it, that if you can withstand getting beat up, the indignities, he, he called it, because it was you know, I went through indignities during that exam. If you can learn that you can put up with that and still go, you can go far. And uh, I think he was, in some ways, he was happy I was going to give it another try. And then I changed my approach and I studied differently and I had my friends help me pummel me with questions so I could be prepared for an oral exam from these smart professors. And I was able to pull it out the second time through. The idea is that my, my going back to your question, intention, and then needing perseverance and grit, my intention was to try to get uh, a PhD, if I could, from MIT. That was my intention. And then once you have that as a goal or an intention or something you want to do, get ready to get knocked down a bit. And uh, it doesn't always happen that way. Some people are able to get through it. They're better prepared than I was, perhaps. Uh, a lot of people did pass that exam on the first try, but it didn't work that way for me. And so I had to get up and, and try it again. And I'm, I'm very glad I did, of course. I heard you tell that same story on another podcast, and the podcaster kind of ruined the moment because he said he had run into the same thing at Carnegie Mellon, uh -huh. failed, but then never took the test again. Yeah, that's the thing. You're not taking it again is rough. I remember when I failed, before I went back to my advisor, I called the dean's office. And it's, it's always interesting, I find, if you look back at these times in your life, I think it's almost like these guardian angels are there to help you. And I remember calling the dean's office, and it was the dean at the time was Frank Perkins. And he, I knew who he was, and he knew me. And and I was what I want to do is I was thinking of changing my degree, of going not going for the PhD, but going, I already got my master's degree, but going for a degree called the engineer's degree. Which a lot of military people got, by the way, John. We had a lot of military guys and men and women up at the, they were up at MIT, and they had enough time there to be able to get not just the masters, but take extra classes and get the engineer's degree, which was more coursework. It's twice the coursework, and you do an extra thesis component. It's not the PhD, so if you have a little, little more time, let's say, than to get the master's degree, you could get that. So it was a pretty popular degree. I remember, especially among some of the military friends I had up in grad school. But I was thinking, all right, well, I've got all these other classes. Maybe I'll switch from PhD to the engineer's degree and get out while I can on another semester, let's say. And I remember calling the dean's office to see. Back then, that's when we would call people. Email wasn't that popular back then, but you'd get on the phone, you know. So I called the dean's office, and, and Dean Perkins wasn't there, but a guy named Ike Colbert was the associate dean, and he took my call. And I remember telling him the situation, and I was thinking about filing the paperwork to go to, and he said to me, he goes, Mike, he says, and I didn't know him very well. It was the other dean that I knew well. And he goes, Mike, he said, you want to think real hard about this next decision you're going to make. You are, you have this great opportunity in front of you. I know you've been knocked down, but you want to think really hard before you give up that big brass ring. I remember him saying that. And I think what he meant was the, the MIT ring that you get when you graduate is a brass, they call it a brass rat because it's a, a beaver, which is the school's mascot on a brass ring. I don't know if that's what he was talking about. If he was talking about like on the merry-go-round, the brass ring or the expression. But I remember him saying that and it uh, hit me. You want to give yourself a chance to succeed here. And uh, and that was one of the things. It was great that Dean Colbert was able to take my call that day and uh, give me that to think about. And uh, and then I decided to give another try and, and made it. And it's not anything different with the astronaut program too. And in that case where you get, you, you get knocked down. And I also talk about it in the book that when I was at Georgia Tech, this was after my my third rejection when I got medically disqualified, I was still trying to get back in the game. There was a, a guy there who had also interviewed in my for my for the astronaut class I was trying to get into. And uh, I was so I was just sitting at my desk one day and like my first week at work at Georgia Tech after being rejected this third time and moving my family to Atlanta, this faculty member pokes his head in my office and says, hey, you interviewed to be an astronaut? And I go, yeah. He goes, we had a guy over in some other department. I forget what the department was, electrical engineering or someplace, computer science or something like that. 
And uh, he also interviewed. And they go, really? And so I wrote this guy a note or called him up or whatever. And they said, but this time it was a few years later, we had email back then. So I think I might have emailed the guy or whatever I did to get a hold of him. And he invited me over to his house for a, for a barbecue with my family. And he was really together and smart and on his way to tenure. And I figured, and if they don't pick him, they're never going to pick me. I don't stand a chance. This guy's really impressive. And I asked him, of course, this afternoon, cooking hamburgers. I said, do you think you're going to try to become an, you're going to apply again? And he looks at me and he says, no, I'm not. And I said, well, why would you not try again? And he says, well, they turned me down once. They'll probably just turn me down again. And I hate to tell you this, John, but I gave him no encouragement. I just shut right up. And I was like, okay. And right, right then I knew that he had given up and there was no chance he's ever getting selected. They're not going to come and knock on anybody's door for an opportunity like that. As you're going back to the story you're telling about Wendy, yeah, a lot. Of, you you got to wonder, though, if, if people give up, does it really mean that much to them? I think in this guy's case, he was on a great career path, uh, getting, you know, becoming a, I'm sure, I don't know what happened, but I'm, I bet he became a tenured professor or did something great, too. And uh, a lot of people just find out it's not for them. But I think you have to be really honest with yourself. Is that really not for me? Do I really want to give this up? When I write about it in the book, what are you going to think about yourself years from now? Or do you want to regret? Are you going to wonder what if I did this or that? You know, you want to treat, you're going to have that in life anyway. You always go, ah, I should have done this or that, whatever. You're going to have, I think that's uh, something that's going to happen to everybody anyway, but you want to minimize that, especially for the big <laughs> things. But you want to try to minimize those regrets. And I think, especially when it comes to a life's dream. So hopefully the folks that give up are giving up because there's something else they'd rather pursue. But if you've got to, you've really got to be honest with yourself. And that was part of my problem too. I don't know if problem's the right word, but to be honest with myself, to know that what I wanted to do was something that was near impossible to get the opportunity to do, I, I just I had to realize that that was the case. And I could say, oh, it really doesn't matter. I really don't care. But that's not what I felt in my heart. If I really looked inside and was honest with myself, it's something I really wanted to do. And then I was faced with the reality, well, this is going to be really hard and uh, get ready for the ride. Yeah, you might not know this, but Wendy told me when she was at MIT, she was failing a class and she thought she was looking at her aspiration of becoming an astronaut mm -hmm. as it was going out the window. And mm -hmm. similar to the story you tell, she said, well, I can just assume the worst that I'm never going to be able to understand this Greek that they're teaching me, mm -hmm. or I can double down, ask for help. Yeah. Um, something that you talk about in the book and get assistance in overcoming this challenge that I'm facing. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what she did. And she was able to get through it. And, you know, the rest is history. But yeah. oftentimes we hit those things and we just decide to throw in the towel when yeah. it can be our moment of actually breaking through. And as I was reading your book, was thinking about after getting these rejection letters, finally getting the acceptance letter, and then receiving this warning that you need to practice your swimming school skills. <laughs> yeah. And then can you tell the audience why that set off alarm bells for you? Yeah, John, I, you know, unlike you in the Navy, I, I avoided the water. When growing up, I just never really learned to swim very well. I didn't like it. I was a skinny kid. I was always, I was always cold when I was in the water. Uh, I didn't take swimming lessons. And I might've been 10 or 11 when my mom forced me to try to learn to swim. By then I was like trying to fake it anyway. So I never really learned and I just avoided the water. I could get by a little bit, but I, I didn't enjoy swimming. I didn't like the water. And then after you get accepted as an astronaut, I, I got this letter to saying in the, in the welcome letter, it said, congratulations. At first you get a phone call. That's how you find out. And then the info packet comes and it said, please practice your swimming because you're going to have to pass a swim test in order to go through water survival training with the Navy. I was like, what? And I was, I was like both happy and sad. I was horrified that I was going to have to do this, but I was really excited that they didn't ask me if I could swim during, and they asked you everything during the interview. And they do this extensive background search and everything else. And not once was my swimming skills ever questioned. So I, I was really grateful that they never asked me because if they did, I would have been like, maybe not. But maybe they just felt like most people, it was like a, a life skill that everyone should have. And it's like making a grilled cheese sandwich. It should be something you know how to do. So I think they were figuring, all right, this guy must have had a, I don't know. They didn't question me before, but they were saying practice of swimming. Or maybe they felt it was something that they could teach you if need be. And they wanted us to practice and so on. So that's what I did. And they gave us all the requirements that we were going to have to perform in order to pass the swim test in order to go to water survival with the Navy in Pensacola. And I wasn't feeling good about this. And 
we show up for work and after the first week that friday before the beginning of the weekend on a friday afternoon the, the all the sardines are sitting in a classroom and the first week was a lot of administrative stuff we did get a visit from neil armstrong which was cool but he happened to be in town and came and spoke to us which was something i'll never forget and but, but it was mainly administrative and then on, on that friday as we're getting ready to go home for the weekend jeff ashby who's a navy pilot in a class ahead of ours was our sponsor helping us get through our training he said uh, first week's over and before you go for the weekend i want to remind everybody that monday our training starts in earnest with the swim test and I thought, oh man of all things a swim test yeah I was like, can we have a math quiz because something else does it have to be a swim it's going to be the swim test my heart sunk but then he goes on to say who are the strong swimmers in this group and we had a few people raise their hand we had heidi piper and lee morin were certified navy divers they had that certification and uh, we had some other people that felt they were strong swimmers and then they said okay and, and jeff continues who are the weak swimmers and i raised my hand as did a couple of the other guys and the other people in my class and they said All right, everyone else can go home but the strong swimmers and the weak swimmers are going to stay after class and you're going to arrange a time to meet over the weekend and the strong swimmers are going to help the weak swimmers with their swimming because when we go to the pool on Monday, no one leaves the pool until everyone passes that test. And uh, that kind of set up the world that I was going to be in, which I think, John, came out of what you had gone through in the academy and in the military was this idea that there's, there's no individual success. I mean, individual accomplishments and promotions and good fitness reports and all that stuff are great. But what really matters is how the mission is and uh, is going on and how the team does. That's really your measure of success. And uh, you could be Michael Phelps, but if you let one of your classmates not pass, if you didn't help when it went from one of your classmates failed, then really you failed because you didn't help them. And on my end, I didn't want to be the person keeping back the whole class. So it really gave me that incentive to try to push a little more. And I think that kind of helps on both ends. And with that attitude, the stronger folks in something will help the weaker ones. And the weaker ones, not to hold back the team, will accept that help. So you you give help when you can give it, and you accept help when you need it, and admit that you need it, and sometimes that's harder. But we all went to the pool on that Monday, and we all ended up passing the test together. Well, you're absolutely correct. The Academy, one of the things that they really double down on you is that your life depends upon the person next to you because you each have strengths and weaknesses, and there's going to come a time when you're going to need their expertise. And this whole swimming thing resonates directly with me because I – had a friend when I was going through, Vinny Smith was a football player. We went to prep school together. And in order to graduate, you have to jump off uh, the, the 10 meter uh, board. But more mm -hmm. importantly, you had to do this swim. I can't remember the distance, but you had to swim it in full uniform. You couldn't touch the side of the pool. And mm -hmm. Vinny had basically no fat on him. So when he would just sink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I remember myself and a couple other people swam the whole thing next to him and practiced with him to get yeah. him through this. Uh, yeah. And then luckily he went Marine Corps because. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard stories about that swim test where some guys, you can jump off that platform with other guys. You can hold hands and it's an exercise in getting everyone through it. From That's what I've heard. If, if push comes to shove, they will get you over that thing any way they can. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think I personally would want to have to do that. Unless yeah. I was really practiced at doing it because once you jump, it's a lot farther than you think. But <laughs> yeah. well, speaking of jumping, I remember going through the training exercises the first time I got into a T38 and mm -hmm. the exercises of if you were going to have to bail. Mm -hmm. And I understand you yourself learned a pretty painful lesson when you were the co-pilot of a T38 on the need to speak up. And I was hoping you could share that lesson. Yeah, certainly. It's in a chapter in the book called Speak Up, which uh, we were encouraged to do. And we had, before we got trained to fly as a co-pilot in a T-38, coming in as a civilian with no high-performance jet time, I was going to be the novice here, right? Along with a lot of other people. But we were going to be flying with very experienced pilots. All the pilots the military pilots in my astronaut class, plus other pilots who were astronauts who weren't in my class, plus instructor pilots. All these folks had thousands of hours in a high-performance jet. A lot of them have flown combat. They had test pilots, most of them. So they were the best pilots in the world, right? And they're going to be in the front. I'm going to be in the back. And I'm the new guy, not knowing even how to strap in. One of my first flights was with an Air Force guy, Air Force pilot, Jim Kelly, 
Vegas and he was my astronaut classmate and good guy immediately became friends and he was going out on a night flight he wanted to get some night time so he's going to go out to San Antonio and he would come back at night time to, to log night time and I asked him if I want to go with him and I was like yeah sure so we flew out there and everything was fun and jovial's flying he was showing me stuff it was great and then we're coming back and at night things get a little different just when the sun goes down you lose I think right there you lose some awareness of what's happening you can't see as well you know, it's it's the end of the day. You're maybe a little more tired. So mistakes, I think, in general, you've got it. I think your antenna needs to go up at nighttime when you're operating, doing something. And uh, as we're getting ready to go to the runway, we're still getting our clearance. The controller tells us to turn to a, a heading you know, 360, let's say. And so if I put that in the flight computer, which is my job. I only have about two or three hours. This is like my fourth or fifth flight now coming up, including the one that we took to get out to San Antonio. And Vegas has like 8,000 hours and a very accomplished pilot. Anyway, so I put that heading in there and then we taxi out to the runway. And then on the runway, before getting cleared for takeoff, they change the heading. So I think I said maybe 360 and he changed it to say to 180. So we have a new heading and I put that in there and we rolled down the runway. He likes the afterburner and as he takes off, he starts heading toward the first heading that we got when we were still getting ready for taxi, right? We're still getting clearance. And, uh, and I see him going in the wrong way. And I see where I put the heading bug to go the other way. He's just going by what he heard. He's on his way. And I thought to myself, what do I know? This is the experienced guy in front of me. I, he's got to know what he's doing. Maybe I misheard. And right at that moment, when I was thinking that as we're going in the wrong direction at a high speed, the tower controller comes over and says, NASA 911, make a hard right turn now, now, right turn now. So he whips the airplane off on the, into the correct direction. And whoa, he's like, what was that? He goes, did, did they change our heading? Did I miss something? And I go, yeah, they changed it. And he goes, they did? I go, yeah, it's right there in, on the heading bug. I put it right in there in a flight computer too. And he's like, you knew we were going in, I was going in the wrong direction and you didn't say anything? And I, I said something like, I thought you knew what you were doing. <laughs> and then, and that was it. We didn't hear anything. There was no chatter anymore after that. We just executed the flight. And once we landed, when we got on the ground, I learned, I, I, Vegas got in my face. He wasn't mean about it or anything, but he was very serious. And uh, what had happened was we almost had a midair with another airplane that had shown up coming into that airfield. So we got, we almost ran into this other airplane because I didn't say anything. But he would get out of the airplane. And he says, look, Mess, we almost got killed because I went in the wrong direction. But you almost got us killed because you didn't speak up. And the most, the number one lesson you need to learn from tonight is speak up. Even if you think you're wrong, if you think you see something or notice something, if you're wrong, I will tell you you're wrong, but I'll always thank you for speaking up. But you have to speak up. You can't not say anything. And that was a lesson that I learned in in, in, in a future occurrence when I was faced with that situation. I would never hesitate to speak up. And sometimes I was wrong, but it's better to speak up and be wrong than to stay quiet and have something bad happen. Well, Mike, we've just touched on the surface of your book today. I'm going to just bring up some of the other chapters that you have. Trust your training, trust your gear, and trust your team. You can always make it worse. You go into the first rule of leadership, mm -hmm. a chapter called Houston, We Have a Problem. The 32nd rule, Be Amazed and Know When to Pivot. Definitely a book, just like your other New York Times bestselling book, that a listener definitely wants to check out. I wanted to end the discussion on this question. You are one of the lucky few people who have experienced this phenomenon called the overview effect and the awe of looking down on our planet. In a world that for so many people feels mundane today, experiencing that overview effect and that feeling of oneness, how did it change? your view of the topic of mattering, like how you mattered and how other people matter. There's a chapter in the book that talks about, it's called Be Amazed. And it's about looking at our planet from space, I thought I was looking into absolute paradise and can't imagine any place uh, being more beautiful than our planet, our home. And I think as far as us mattering, I think we matter a lot because we got a really cool place to live. I think there might be, I believe that there is life other places. I don't think we've encountered it yet, but I think we're going to find each other at some point. But I would be shocked if wherever they are, they have a place as beautiful as our planet. And I think we are in a very unique spot. It's a complete and utter paradise that we're living in. And I think you see its true beauty from space. I and mean, maybe that's what 
people define as the overview effect is seeing how beautiful our plate or gives you that perspective. We don't have when you go to a uh, top of a building and look down at the city or you, even just a few stories out on a balcony looking out over an area, you can't, is that this, is that, you get a different perspective of it. And that space is, is a, a huge change in perspective where you get to see the, the whole planet pretty much. And it's just, it's beautiful and it's amazing. And, but it also, I think, affects what you can appreciate on the ground, at least for me. I'm here right now on a trip in Boston and it's the full colors are out. And I was looking at the blue sky yesterday and with some whiffy clouds going by and I was looking through a telescope last night at the moon and Jupiter. And there's so many cool things to look at here on our planet. So you can look at it from afar from space and see, I think, the way it's supposed to be seen in some ways, that total beauty coming at you in a different perspective. But I think we have to remember we're in it all the time. And every day we have to interact in this planet that we have, this home that we have, whether it's with nature or even the buildings, what people have created. I don't. I try not to mind crowds anymore. I like being around people because in space, you're not around them as much. I miss that. I miss going to big gatherings. You miss the smells of Earth. You miss the sounds, the weather. We don't have any of that in space. So I think it gives you an opportunity to appreciate how beautiful and fragile the planet is. But I think you need to bring that with you and share it with others to appreciate. I'm looking out the window now, the beauty that we enjoy every day. If you're in the country or in the city, there's it's really a spectacular place we live in. Well, I love that answer, Mike. And where's Thanks, the best I, place? I was where's worried, it? man. I didn't, you asked me that <laughs> question, John. I didn't know what I was going to say. I was a little worried, <laughs> but thank you. Where's the best place a listener can go to learn more about you? We'll obviously have the book in the uh, show notes. Thanks. Well, I have a website. Maybe that's a good place. MikeMassimino.com might be a good place to go. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I was the first guy to tweet from space. A Mastro underscore Mike. Uh, I don't know what they call Twitter now. It's something else. X or whatever. To, X. Yeah. Instagram, Astro Mike Massimino. And I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. So uh, feel free to reach out. That's where you can find me. And on the website, there's a way to contact me on the website as well. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. It was such an incredible honor to have you. And congratulations thank, on the launch you, of your book. Thank you. And thank you for your service to our country in the Navy. I'm glad you hung out with some pretty cool people. Yeah, that's that's a thank you for that. And thank you for having me on the show and promoting the book too, John. It's very nice spending some time with you. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. It was completely my honor to have you. Thank you, John. I thoroughly enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Mike Massimino, and I wanted to thank Mike, Alyssa Fortunato, and also Hachette Books for the honor and privilege of having them appear on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with my friend Gordy Ball, the founder of the Conscious Thought Revolution and the author of the new Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The New Millionaire's Playbook, Seven Keys to Unlock Freedom, Purpose, and Abundance. Over the next 10 years, we are undergoing the largest wealth transfer in modern history. Accenture reports that there will be over $70 trillion that are moving hands from the boomer generation to millennials and Gen Z. And millennials and Gen Z have a much different set of values than the boomer generation. They care more about sustainability, regeneration, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, physical health. This affords the greatest opportunity to generate abundance as well. So for those who are feeling that life does look hopeless, and, and at moments it may, but really that is the universe really calling us forward and saying it's really time to wake up, discover your purpose, raise your consciousness, and shine your light bright because the opportunity to generate abundance now is like never before. Remember that we rise by lifting others, so share this show with those that you love and care about. And if you found today's episode with Mike Massimino on the topic of Moonshot inspirational, then definitely share the show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, go out there and become passion struck. Mm -hmm.